actually, I was in the teens yesterday, they had all kinds of questions, it's on their minds. And I'm talking about the question of transgenderism, transgender ideology, where does it come from? Um, why is it springing up now in Earth's history? And uh, it kind of goes along with what I'm talking about this afternoon at 2.30. I'll be talking about the much wider philosophical world of critical theory, which is dominating universities across the West now. Transgenderism is a small manifestation of that. So um, I'll just be focusing this morning on transgenderism. So let's bow our heads and we'll open, ask God to open our hearts and our minds. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the chance for us to gather here, for the freedom we enjoy yet here in this country to worship you, uh, to learn and to discuss ideas. I pray, Father, that you will bless this time we spend together now. May your spirit, uh, I pray you'll speak through me and for me. I pray, Lord, that the words I share will not just be for knowledge, but they'll be for um, building up of your church here in this nation. I pray, Father, for every parent whose child is going through this kind of, um, uh, going through transgenderism, and I pray, Lord, that we as a church can better love and understand and support and minister to those who are caught up uh, within this new ideology. So, Father, I pray your blessing upon us now. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. <coughs> So I recognize that this is going to be recorded and it's going out online. <clears throat> I've learned over the years there's a few cardinal rules of speaking. Watch it. One is never answer a hypothetical question when you're online because somebody will give you an extreme situation and they're going to have to give a response to an extreme situation. And when they broadcast it, they cut out the question. They just show your extreme response. So I never give hypothetical answers to hypothetical problems. That's number one. And number two is, because we live in a world where every word you say will be taken down and used in evidence against you, I have to be extremely careful in what I say. So if I come across as slow at times or very deliberate in what I'm saying, it's because you're going to be posting this online and um, you know, we all have to live with the consequences of what I'm saying here this morning. So I'll be very deliberate in what I say um, as we talk about what is a very, very difficult topic for many people. Um, we, we, we start out by recognizing I think it's important to recognize this, that we're reaffirming, reaffirming today afresh the gospel of God's love, mercy, and grace given to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, we approach the question of transgenderism from a position of fundamental equality and solidarity with those who are suffering from what psychiatrists used to call gender dysphoria and is now more commonly known as transgenderism for we are all brothers and sisters in need of a savior. And we're all lost sinners without hope, saving the abiding mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. So we're not talking down, we're not talking up, we're talking across because we have brothers and sisters, sons and daughters who are caught up in transgenderism. And we, maybe as parents, um, we may be concerned about our children, um, but at the end of the day, we're all sinners in need of a savior. And we all manifest the brokenness of sin in different ways. In a church that exists by the grace of God, there is no misplaced pride, uh, space for, there's no space for misplaced spiritual pride um, or the demeaning of others or the sense that our own sense of righteousness earns us our own salvation. And uh, it is Christ's death on Calvary is our only hope for salvation and our only hope for a new beginning and our only hope to become a new creation. So therefore, we talk about the issue of transgenderism today um, recognizing that every child that is born is created in the image of God. And if they, if they suffer with what is known as gender dysphoria or experience what we know more colloquially known, known as transgenderism, uh, we speak with love and compassion. And we affirm that renewal and transformation and eternal life come to those who look to Jesus Christ in faith. And we are to love such persons as ourselves. And according to the teachings of Jesus, Matthew 7, 12, in all things, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. We are to treat people caught up in the, in the situation of transgenderism as we would wish to be treated ourselves. So we're not talking in an, a sense of anger. We're not talking a sense of, of um, accusation. We're not talking with a sense of frustration. We are recognizing that sin manifests itself in many ways. And I'm just as broken as you are. And we carry the brokenness of sin in different ways in our bodies and in our minds. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about some of the history it's important that we know where this is coming from. 
it's important we know some of the uh, philosophy behind this transgenderism um, phenomenon that we now see sweeping the West. And uh, then we're going to come to how do we respond to it as Christians. And uh, as I said yesterday, I spoke with the teens. They asked me to speak about mental health. And the one question that many of them had was transgenderism. So it's obviously on your teenage kids' minds. So it's important for us as parents and as grandparents to be able to understand where this has come from, what are the philosophical basis, bases for transgenderism, and how can we respond to this. So I'm going to start out um, with um, some history. You can see a lot of my sermons there on Audioverse. They don't get banned on Audioverse. But um, if you type my name in there, there's, I don't know, 40 or so sermons. They talk about topics like this. Do you remember seeing this picture? 2015, June 26, the Obergefell versus Hodges case was a landmark civil rights case in the United States in which the US Supreme Court ruled uh, that same-sex couples had the fundamental constitutional right to marry under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th, um, the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And on that night, President Obama, who was a big pusher for this kind of stuff, he lit up the White House in the rainbow flag of the LGBTQ movement. And President Obama said, and I quote, I didn't have the chance to comment on how good the White House looked in rainbow colors, to see people gathered in the evening on a beautiful summer night and to feel whole and to feel accepted and to feel they had a right to love. That was pretty cool. That was a good thing, end quote. Obama then pivoted to the next wave of the sexual revolution, which is transgender ideology. And in May 13, 2016, he sent out a letter. It's now known uh, to historians as the Dear Colleague Letter. It is an infamous letter the Department of Justice and Education sent this out to the nation's public schools and colleges, setting out new federal policy on gender identity, defined in the letter as, quote, an individual's internal sense of gender that is no longer tied to biology. Now, schools must now allow students, quote, to participate in sex-segregated activities and access sex-segregated sex facilities consistent with their gender identity, because those federal educations, education and justice, would now, quote, treat a student's gender identity as the student's sex for purposes of, of enforcing Title IX. Now, Title IX was passed in 1972 of the Education Amendments. It was intended to give women equal opportunities to sports within colleges because men dominated sports in colleges in the States and Congress wanted women to have a fair chance of having their own sports. And so Title IX of the Education Amendments was passed in 72. But transgender ideologues and activists now insist that anything less than full access to the sex-specific intimate facility of your choice, such as a swimming pool changing room, would be deemed a transphobic denial of civil rights and equality. And so to be granted these accommodations, as, uh, schools would not be allowed to, quote, require transgender students to have a medical diagnosis, undergo any medical treatment, or produce a birth certificate or an ID document before treating them consistent with their gender identity, end of quote. So essentially what the Obama administration said was that you only have to declare yourself another gender and the school must accept it, no questions asked. You simply say at 9 o'clock at night as a 13-year-old boy, I'm a girl, and you must be bunked with the girls. The teacher has no right to question it. You cannot ask for evidence of a psychological or psychiatric examination. You cannot ask for evidence of a physical sex change uh, surgery. You cannot ask for anything. Um, you simply have to accept what that 13-year-old boy um, thinks about himself. This ran into a lot of public opposition in the United States. So uh, further on to that, in 2016, the Department of Housing and Urban Development finalized what they called the Gender Identity Rule for Equal Access to HUD's housing programs, and it eliminated the Equal Access Rule, which was designed to give women equal access to sex-specific intimate facilities by removing the exemption for single-sex emergency shelters with common sleeping areas or bathrooms to not um, allow transgender women in. So from now on, 2016, services for homeless women, battered women, abused women, runaway women, raped women, would now be required to offer equal access to a man who identified as a woman to sleep with the women in those shelters. No religious exemptions were allowed by the Obama administration. No consideration was given to the particular needs for physical protection, psychological and emotional safety of those addicted and battered women, runaway girls, abused wives, and so forth in the mental health uh, shelters across our nation, the nation of the US. And this ran into a lot of public opposition, that people are OK saying, I support transgenderism until it's your daughter that gets caught up in it. 
and the man who thinks he's a woman declares himself to be a woman may force himself on her in a sex-specific facility such as a changing room um, or a bunkhouse or in a, a shelter of some kind. So let's look at some biology 101. Biological sex is identified by the organization of an organism for sexual reproduction. Now, organisms exist at multiple levels, but they're all characterized by the integrated function of the parts for the sake of the whole. And male and female organisms have different parts that are functionally integrated for the sake of a larger whole, that is reproduction. Essentially, males donate genetic materials, the females receive and gestate those genetic materials, and out comes the resulting offspring. Biological sex is organized by the organization for sexual reproduction. It's as simple as that. Now, this is fixed into our genes. We know that XY is male because the Y chromosome ordinarily carries the, what is known as the SRY gene. That's the sex-determining region on the Y gene. And that directs the formation of the male testes. The women are XX. Um, now, the issue about this is that this thing works. There, the SRY gene, for six weeks in the uterus, you do not know if it's a boy or a girl. You have to wait until week seven. In week seven, the SRY gene initiates the formation of testicular differentiation, or that's when the male testes start to develop. But for the first six weeks in utero, nothing happens in the first few weeks of the, the uh, infant's life, or the baby's life. But in week seven, the SRY gene initiates the formation of testicular differentiation. And this has a profound impact on how we develop. I mean, early childhood, there are not that significant physical differences among boys and girls, but the differences really kick in when, pu when puberty arrives. And when puberty arrives, the different hormones are produced, um, estrogen and, and, um, and uh, testosterone being the prime examples, and then there appear very significant differences in male and female bodies. The differences in your size, in your shape, in your bone length, in your bone density, the fat distribution across your body, the musculature and the development of various organs, including the brain, and those differences are, are profoundly consequential for our experiences of experiencing pain, our experience of aging, our experiences of reproduction. And so those are profoundly consequential differences between the male and the female bodies. Now, there are some well-known disorders of sexual development, DSDs, and they can result in ambiguous external genitalia uh, or the incomplete development of your external genitalia or reproductive organs or the formation of two sets of sex organs uh, this is frequently called um, by people, uh, these are frequently, fre frequently viewed as chromosomal defects. Now, disorders of sexual development are not a third sex, but they are a pathology in the development of the existing male or female body. Like something's gone wrong. It's like you buy a car, but there's only three wheels on it. It's not that there's a new kind of car out there. You have a car with three wheels and you need to put a fourth wheel on it, okay? It's a pathology in the development of male or female. And uh, you have a very famous runner from South Africa, I believe, Kasta Semanya, is that how you pronounce? I'm not sure if it's his or a he, I really don't know. I mean, is it male or female? Does she run in the female, the female races? Okay. And I understand for, for Kasta, it took many, many uh, months, if not years, for the International Olympic Committee to figure out whether Kasta was male or female. And um, again, disorders of, dis disorders of sexual development are a pathology in the development of the male body or the female body. And so you have two sets of sex organs or incomplete development of one set of sex organs. And you have very ambiguous external genitalia. These are extremely, extremely rare. So when you have the LGBTQIA, I stands for intersex. Those are people who are, there's a, there's a pathology there in their development. They are not quite sure, nobody really knows, are they male or female? Now, people who have this condition suffer immensely. Um, we've already covered that. DSDs are not a third sex, but they're a pathology in the normal healthy developments of a male or a female body. So intersex individuals with DSD manifest a wide variety of clinical conditions that are medically diagnosable. Some are not obvious at birth, and some are life-threatening, such as CAH. And some of those conditions need to be watched for for possible development of uh, cancer, dysplastic gonads, undescended testicles, etc., etc. And intersex individuals need careful parental supervision and support, not just as they're growing up for the rest of their lives. And you wouldn't, watch, you wouldn't wish this on anybody. It is a pathology in the development of a healthy human body. But it's not transgender. That's a critical thing. Transgender has nothing to do with biology. 
Now, the DSM-5, if you're a psychologist, at least in the States, you have the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is like the Bible for psychologists. The current version, DSM-5, defines gender dysphoria as, quote, incongruence between one's experienced and expressed gender and your assigned gender. And it goes in conjunction with clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. That seems reasonable, but it's actually ideological language. And uh, it's a significant change from DSM-4. In DSM-4, uh, the psychologists use the term gender identity disorder, and they recognize that there was a disconnection between physical reality and the subjective self-understanding, and that disconnect was a matter of psychological concern. So my body says that I am biologically male, but my mind says that I'm female. There's a, there's a break, a discontinuity between what my body says and what my mind thinks. That would be viewed as gender dysphoria. And so uh, gender, transgender people come to me and they ask for help and counseling. And I don't say you're a biological female, we need to turn you into a woman, because that's not going to get very far. It's more helpful to say something like, well, how do we find alignment between what your body says and your mind thinks? It's a less pejorative way of, of opening a conversation. How do we find alignment between what your body is and what your mind thinks about yourself? Now, DSM-4, which is now out of date, um, it changed to DSM-5 due to massive political pressure, particularly at Johns Hopkins. Um, but uh, the, the change from DSM-4 to DSM-5 um, did not happen because there was any new psychological research into this or understanding of endocrinology or, um, and so forth. It happened because there was massive political pressure from the activists who, who wants to um, make the medical profession support the concept of transgenderism. It's a political agenda, not a biological or a psychological um, serious set of research that has led to the change in the DSM-4 to 5. Now this here, DSM-5, which is what we have now, let's see if this reaches there. Okay, do you see the red dot? It's ideological because this word here, when is, your, when is your gender assigned to you? It's when you pop out and the doctor says, congratulations, ma'am, it's a boy. That is now viewed as being your assigned gender. If your gender was assigned, it leaves open the possibility that you were misassigned or you were misgendered, that the doctor was just looking at the biology without understanding the psychology of the individual. And so this is ideological language. A uh, particularly famous transgender ideologue guy called Adkins argues that gender identity is, quote, a person's inner sense of belonging to a particular gender, such as male or female, which implies there may be many other gender identities waiting to be discovered. And the American Psychological Association now defines gender identity as, quote, a person's internal sense of being male, female, or something else. So that's, again, being, being pressured by the activists going to the uh, Psychological Association. So we see that, the, the, just as we saw with the sexual revolution on Friday, that there has been massive political pressure on the psychiatrists to normalize um, same-sex attraction and on the preachers and on the lawyers to normalize it. There's been massive political pressure from the trans activists to normalize, in the eyes of the psychologists of the United States, um, gender identity as being a new concept and so your gender is either male, female, or something else. So my counsel to you is choose your psychologist very carefully if you visit a psychologist. So what does the stage of transition look like? Well, there are four stages to the trans transition. The first is the social transition. This is where there are changes in gender expression in roles, changes in your dress, helping the person live as if they are a member of another sex. Now, the most obvious battleground for this is on genders. Uh, sorry, on um, pronouns. You've heard about the pronoun wars? Somebody may say, my name is Conrad Vine, my preferred genders are she, they. People put it on their Twitter bio, they put it on Facebook, and if you're kind of a with it person, if you're a progressive person, your Twitter bio now says, Conrad Vine, preferred pronouns, you know, she, hey, she, she they, vex, if, if I choose that, and then you must call me that. And uh, my gender identity is queer, questioning, uncertain, intersex. I mean, there's all kinds of things in there and, um, and so forth. So that's what people are now putting on their identities on Twitter and on Facebook. And so the, the social transition 
Um, it helps the person live as they're a member of another sex. This is a really big deal for teenage girls. And it used to be that transgenderism was mostly a male phenomenon. And the last 15 years, with the, ab of the advent of the Apple iPhone, it switched to its overwhelmingly female. Now, there was a, um, a whistleblower from Facebook gave a report in Congress two weeks ago to explain how Facebook knows the mental damage it's causing teenagers, and teenage girls in particular, through Snapchat and Instagram. Now, there's a reason for this. There's a reason why transgenderism is overwhelmingly a female phenomenon, girls transition to boys rather than boys transition to girls. Uh, the number, I say, one is when girls, teenage girls have their iPhones, and you can chart the rise of student mental health problems to the advent of the iPhone. There's a, there's a clear correlation that when the iPhone came out, from that moment on, uh, mental health problems across the West skyrocketed in young people. Um, but particularly with Snapchat and Instagram and some of the other social media apps out there, young teenage girls have the phones and they, they skim through and they see these impossibly airbrushed models of girls out there, yes? They see pictures of women that are simply impossible to achieve. And that's what's held up as the ideal for a woman. And most girls from about the age of 12 to 18 are going through the period of puberty and their bodies are all over the place, okay? A girl is a girl at the age of 12, she's a woman about the age of 18, and in between it's kind of like an octopus, okay? It's, it's going hither and thither, and, all right? <clears throat> Don't quote me on that, but you know what I'm talking about. And the result is that many young girls are very shy about their body appearance. They're, they're acutely aware of what their body looks like. They're embarrassed about it, they hide it. They walk around holding their, holding their school books like this. They hide away in the corner. And this is, what, this is a part of a natural process of growing up, but they see in their cell phones these impossible pictures of impossible women. And they think, I can never match up. So you can either go from being the gawky girl in the corner who's embarrassed about her physical appearance and who has a sense of shame that her body is nothing like you know, these famous film stars, or she can become a boy. And when she said, declares that she's a boy, Nobody cares about her appearance because nobody cares about teenage boys' appearances. You don't see idealized male images on Snapchat or Instagram very much. It's only female bodies. And so for girls who are insecure, who are uncertain about their physical appearance as they go through the process of puberty, uh, the trans option gives you a great way out of being insecure about your body. You can declare yourself a boy, you can put a tube chest around so that you know, it squashes your chest, and instead of being the gawky girl in the corner, now everybody celebrates you as a hero and a brave young boy. And so you get social cachet and you avoid the problem of poor body image, which many teenage girls have. And the third issue that it brings is, and we'll talk about this in this afternoon, in, in critical theory, there's a hierarchy of oppression. And white, heterosexual, cisgender males like me are guilty of all Earth's evils and, 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 and problems. And then you get white, heterosexual, cisgender women. Cisgender means you're Gender identity lines up with your biological reality. And then you have white gay males and white gay females, lesbians. Then you get um, black gay males and black gay females. And then you get transgenders in the hierarchy of oppression. Then you get Muslims. That's kind of the, the current hierarchy in critical theory, which is going across all the universities of the West. Now, for a girl who is white, she's near the top of the, the pyramid of oppression. And every day she's taught in class that she's white, she's guilty, she's an oppressor. If she just declares herself a boy, she goes near the bottom of the, of the hierarchy of oppression. Now, she can, and because oppression only goes downwards, like water in a, rate, in a, in a, in a rainfall, um, uh, be, by virtue, if, if I'm lower than you in the hierarchy of oppression, I cannot be guilty of anything against you. So if I'm a white girl, now declaring myself a boy, um, I cannot be accused of racism because I'm lower in the pyramid of oppression. So you gain that coveted victim status. So you have victim status in the hierarchy of oppression, you have hero status because you're brave to become trans and you don't need to worry about your body anymore. This is why transgenderism is a significant phenomenon among teenage girls and it destroys their bodies. It destroys their minds. Because the process they're going through, and so if you've got a teenage girl, be careful what she's watching on her phone. Okay, be careful as parents. The social transition is the first stage. The second stage is psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is uh, you go to visit a counselor, 
And with, with psychologists and gender counselors, they're not there to kind of question what you think about yourself. They're there to accelerate the transition process. They call it gender affirming therapy. You're not going to question, are you really a boy or are you really a girl? If you declare yourself a boy or a girl, then we need to accelerate the transition for you. It's called gender affirming therapy. And if you don't practice it, then you're going to be thrown out of your particular profession. So then you move on to the hormone therapy. The hormone therapy is where you start to lose the ability to have children. Now, this is where things start to become irreversible. The damage to your body is significant. Boys will take testosterone, girls will take estrogen. And this is where you, you lose the ability to bear children. These are, there are lifelong consequences, these decisions that young girls are taking in their teens these days. And once you go to, through the hormone therapy, you then have the surgery. Now, many people don't go to the surgical stage. They may be stuck with the hormone therapy. Uh, they're not quite sure if they want to go to the surgical stage. But with the surgical stage, even that there are many stages of the surgical stage, you can just simply chop off your external genitalia and be kind of like um, neutral. Um, or they may, the surgeons may actually fashion for you new sets of genitalia. And those new sets of genitalia, they can work, but overwhelmingly they don't work. And they lead to ongoing issues with, with um, incontinence, uh, continual bleeding, a failure for the nerves to connect down there. It's a real messy process. You may be wearing um, diapers for the rest of your life if the surgeons don't get it right, which is a very common occurrence. And so this stage here is the final stage of the transition. So when somebody declares themselves to be trans, they're, ex they're with the gender affirming therapy from the psychologist, they're whisked through this process here. And that's, that's what happens in many parts of the world now. And so in Britain, they've now banned the surgical and the hormonal stage for minors because they realize that, and this is what Johns Hopkins realized in the 70s, and Johns Hopkins pioneered this kind of surgery, then they stopped it. And they stopped it because the mental health outcomes after the transition are no better than the mental health trauma that the people are experiencing here. So if 40% of trans kids attempt suicide, that's 40% just attempt it. So the suicidal ideation is way higher than that. The suicidal attempt post-transition is about the same as the suicidal attempts pre-transition, which means statistically there is no improvement in the overall mental health in the trans community. But you put them through a profound physical trauma to get to this place. So those are the four stages of the trans transition. And um, as I said, some people, they go the whole stage. Um, and particularly on Snapchat and on YouTube, there are hundreds and hundreds of trans social influencers. You know what a social influencer is? It's someone who is, you know, they're famous on the internet, teenagers follow them, and they're pushing a certain issue. And there are many, many trans boys out there. Those are girls who are now transitioned to boyhood, and they have their daily dose of, of testosterone. Um, they like being on testosterone because it stops their periods. They no longer have stomach cramps, another advantage for a young teenage girl. Okay, I don't need to worry about my body anymore. Nobody shames me for my body shape. I don't need to have periods anymore. I'm now a social hero. I'm a victim in the critical theory hierarchy. This is a great thing to become a trans girl, a trans boy. There are many advantages for a teenage girl who's shy about her body appearance and doesn't like period pains. And so there are many social influencers. Some of them are at this stage, some are at this stage, some are at this stage, some are at this stage. And, and they, they influence young girls to go through this. These influencers have hundreds of thousands of followers. And it's worth you knowing what your kids are watching on social media. Bored kids sitting alone in their rooms who are uncertain about their body shape are going to gravitate to this. And what, um, another phenomenon here is that transgenderism tends to happen in, in kind of groups. Like if one girl in your school comes out as trans, a bunch of other girls will come out as trans. It doesn't happen often in, in isolation. It's, it's a socialized phenomenon. And so it's not just a medical issue. It's not just a psychological issue. It's also a, a social process as well. Now, there are some problems with transgender ideology. We're going to touch on some of those problems right now. In no other area of life, other than crying over a wet diaper, must uh, teachers and parents and doctors and nurses and psychologists and psychiatrists and parents bow before the profound insight and deep wisdom of a three-year-old. No other clinical condition can be self-diagnosed unquestioningly by a four-year-old anywhere in the world, other than a wet diaper. 
Yet this fantasy was imposed by the Banner administration and by that it has kind of flowed around the world. Physically, the transition treatment means that young children are given puberty blockers and as their treatment progresses, they become infertile. So the irony is that in transitioning to another gender, transgender individuals lose the ability to procreate and this is a tragedy for them. We held um, at our local church and village, we held a sexual purity weekend back in March of this year and it was hosted by um, a man who was 40 years in the gay lifestyle and now he's, he's, he's confessed it all and he's living um, a celibate life now and he's an Adventist. And one of the people he interviewed was a young, young lady who was a girl. She went through the whole process and uh, then she decided that she actually, um, she wasn't a, a boy, she was a girl. And so she detransitioned. Um, but when you speak to her, you see the impact in her body of what the, the transition process did. And, you cannot look with anything other than deep, deep compassion upon such an individual. Um, the body is gone. The body has been scarred beyond recognition. She has heavy, heavy stubble, even as a woman. She can't undo that. Um, the voice has dropped, and she has very kind of masculine shoulders and so forth. And it's very, very hard to know whether she's male or female when you look at her. But her story is typical in that where there's a lot of pressure for young girls in particular to transition to boyhood, to become trans boys, what you never hear about is the large number of trans people who hate what they become and want to transition back. And there is significant evidence that about 80 to 90% of children who express some kind of gender dysphoria, some kind of discomfort with their body and their gender, when they go through psychocounseling and psychotherapy, they actually find alignment between their body and their mind, and they don't need to go through the transition process. That is, it's something you can just grow through. What happens in the West now is that if the moment a child says, I think I'm trans, they get whisked off onto the trans, um, the, the, the conveyor belt. About 15% of teen girls in America are on this conveyor belt right now. And the moment you say, I think I'm trans, we need to start the process right away. In Canada, if a girl says, I think I'm trans, and she, she can start the process, but the parents do not need to be informed. And so, you know, different countries are imposing different laws re relating to this. Left untreated, that is somebody who thinks they are transgender or has gender dysphoria, there are horrendous outcomes for transgender teenagers. Deep depression, profound psychological distress, daily functional impairment, psychosis, self-mutilation, incredibly elevated suicide rates before and after the transition. You would not wish this condition on anybody. It's a terrible, terrible situation to find yourself in. Transgender activists claim that the real self is something other than the physical body. It's a form of pagan Gnostic dualism, yet they embrace a materialistic philosophy in which only the material world actually exists. They promote radical expressive individualism in which transgenders can define their own truth, but then they require everybody else to celebrate it and agree to it, even as the individuals transition across multiple gender identities. So the essential idea is that I'm a biological male and I'm a biological male, and, but gender identity is not tied to the biology, we'll come to why in a few minutes. But up there, there is an infinite number of gender identities, and you can float between them by the hour. You can be gender fluid. So I can be a boy at 10 o'clock, a girl at 10.30, I can be questioning at 10.35, I can be something else at 10.45, and you simply, the, the, the transition is not so much that I have to transition, but you as a society, have to transition in your recognition of who I am by the minute. So theoretically, according to transgender geology, at any one time on planet Earth, if there are seven and a half billion inhabitants of planet Earth, there are seven and a half billion different gender identities because gender is a spectrum and there's no definite mark on it. So it's a spectrum and you can be anywhere on that spectrum. We'll come, why, we'll come to why that is the case in a few minutes. <coughs> there are some logical questions you may ask about transgender ideology. How precisely does a biological male come to the conclusion that he is a woman? That's a good question. If he arrives at the conclusion based on the fact that he feels like a woman, because it's your subjective sense of who you are, how does a biological male know what it feels like to be a woman? It's a logical question. And what exactly is a female feeling? Right, you can buy it in a 7-Eleven. In what objective sense do those feelings make him a woman instead of a feminine man? 
More importantly, if gender is only a social construct and it is not tied to biology, and a woman cannot be defined by her DNA, by her chromosomes, by her biology, by her physiology, her anatomy, her reproductive organs, thoughts or feelings, what exactly is a woman? What is a woman? If you cannot define it. Because the moment you say this is a woman, you're saying that that is not a woman. If that's a woman, then that is not a woman. But the moment you say that you have to eliminate all, all any definition, this could be a woman, that could be a woman, that could be a woman. And so what exactly is a woman? And the irony is we're going to see again in a few minutes is this comes straight out of feminism. The feminism has actually turned the point where it's destroying women. Um, so what exactly is a woman? So the concept of a woman is eliminated of all meaning in trans ideology. To be a trans woman under trans ideology is a meaningless concept because trans ideology has to remove any definition of what it means to be a woman to say that you are a trans woman. You follow me on this? Okay. So, at its core, transgender ideology claims that feelings determine reality, and everybody else must keep up with your feelings, which fluctuate back and forth through the day, or else you're going to be defined as a hate-filled bigot. So you might say, and these are the three most important slides of today, um, intersex or disorders of sexual development is a medical category. It can be diagnosed by a doctor in a consulting room. You have two sets of genitalia, you have one incomplete set of genitalia, you have one or two incomplete sets of genitalia, or you have no genitalia at all. That's a pathology in the development of the human body, and that's known as intersex or disorders of sexual development. That's a medical category. Gender dysphoria is a psychological um, category. That is where the psychologists recognize that there is a disconnect between what my body is and what my mind thinks. And that's known as gender dysphoria. That's a psychological category. And when we treat young girls and young boys who think they are something other than what their body says, if when we treat them for gender dysphoria, between 80 and 90% of them, there's a successful treatment and they come out with their minds and their bodies aligned, which is what you want. But transgender is an ideological category. It's not medical, it's not psychiatric, and it's not psychological. Why? Because you do not need a diagnosis for it. You can simply self-declare from the age of, as soon as you're aware, you can self-declare. You do not need a diagnosis, you do not need a medical or psychiatric or psychological examination. You can simply declare on the spot, this is what I am, and you must accept it. So transgender is an ideological category. It's neither psychological and it's neither medical. Why is it ideological? Again, we'll come to it later today in this presentation and this afternoon. We're going to talk about the bigger picture here. But transgender is an ideological category. So where does this come from? Well, <coughs> Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, we touched on him on Friday in our discussion of the history of the sexual revolution. He opened the Institute for Sexual Research in Berlin in 1919. Um, when Joseph uh, Adolf Hitler came to power, he burnt a lot of books in 1933, including of which he burnt this institute of Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, and he burnt the library to the ground. Perhaps the only defensible thing the Nazis ever did. Hirschfeld moved to France after the Nazis took over, and at the age of 52, he lived in Vichy, France, southern France. He started living with a 19-year-old man called Geiser from Germany, a 24-year-old Chinese man called Li Xu Tong, and uh, he attempted surgery on Geyser to help him kind of transfer from male to female, and I think Geyser died as a result of the complications of the surgery that he did. So Magnus Hirschfeld, um, he published a book in 1910 called Die Transvestiten, um, in which he distinguished between homosexuals and transvestites. A transvestite was someone, a man who dressed up in women's clothing. And he coined the phrase transsexual, which became very popular in the literature in 23. He argued that this is the adoption of a gender role opposite to the, of the gender assigned to you at birth. And he believed that such people were convinced they were assigned to the incorrect sex. Now he uses the word sex as if it's a, but sex is a biological category, gender is, a, is an ideological category, and the two really don't match up. But in the early years of transgender geology, there's a lot of kind of inter, um, intermingling of the use of these terms, not in a way that we would use it today. But in, in the States, there was a German-American endocrinologist called Dr. Harry Benjamin, a friend of Dr. Hirschfeld, who began treating transsexuals, men who believed they were women, with hormones in 48, that was in the DC area. 
And he published a book called The Transsexual Phenomenon in 66 and identified three categories of cross-gender cross -gender types. The firstly was heterosexual men who cross-dressed as a sexual fetish. Number two, cross-dressers with deep emotional disturbances. They're kind of like a halfway house. And thirdly, those with a disturbance of normal sexual and gender orientation. Uh, they are transgender. That was in 1966. We start seeing this term coming about. In the midst of the sexual revolution of the 60s, uh, Western academics initiated the foundational idea of transgenderism, which is that sex and gender are completely separate identity issues. And uh, Benjamin argued, he rejected the idea that sex and gender are synonymous, that you know, I'm a male, therefore I'm a man, or you are a female, therefore you're a woman. And he argued, and this became very popular, gender is above the belt and sex is below the belt. That was kind of the, the argument. He was a psychologist when he came out with that argument, I think. Then you have Dr. Robert Stoller at the University College, University of California, LA, UCLA. He published a very famous book there, Sex and Gender on the Development of Masculinity and Femininity, and he recognized that male and female are biological sex. He then argued that there are corresponding terms such as masculinity and femininity, and gender, on an individual basis, is the relative amount of masculinity or femininity that you have within your character. Which means that as everybody's different, that means you have a gender spectrum. Because you can be 100% masculine or 100% feminine, and then there's an infinite, and it's not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven percent, but it's a millionth of a degree <laughs> going all the way around the gender spectrum there. And so there you have the idea of the gender spectrum coming out of Dr. Robert Stoller's writings in California now, sex and gender are now separate concepts, and they're no longer synonymous from the writings of Dr. Robert Stoller. Now, beyond that, in the late 1960s, within um, literary circles, there was a, a fad known as deconstructionism. Now, deconstructionism argues that, um, it, it argues that it's impossible to know what the author actually meant. So de a deconstructionist reading of the 23rd Psalm would say, if I ask you today, is the 23rd Psalm a psalm about God's comfort for those in times of trouble? What would you say? Yeah? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Okay, he leadeth me through where? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's a psalm of comfort. But deconstructionists argue that, no, no, you can never know what the author intended if the Lord is my shepherd, that means I'm a sheep. And where does the psalm end up? And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you were a sheep in the time of David, would you want to go to the house of the Lord? No, you're going to get your throat slit on the altar. Don't laugh. This is how they interpreted the 23rd psalm. That it ostensibly purports to be a psalm of comfort. It's actually a psalm of terror. For the Lord is my shepherd, I'm going to get my throat cut. Do you want to follow that shepherd? No. So deconstructionism rejects the concept that you can ever know the meaning of a text itself. And it's, this is a foundational principle that you can never know the meaning of a text or of a word. And so we have the hermeneutical triangle is you have a text. And you have God, the author, inspires the text. And I am the reader. And as, as I read the text, I'm trying to figure out what God, as the author, is trying to say to me through the text. But in the 1960s, you have what is known in, in schools of English as reader response criticism, where it's impossible to know who the author is, and therefore it's m my reading of the text is the only authoritative reading. That's why you have a teenager's Bible, husband's Bible, wife's Bible, you know, all that kind of stuff you see in bookstores. It's part of this wider stream of reader response criticism that there's even like a, a bodybuilder's reading of the Bible. And the idea is that no longer is that God has a message for you through the text, it's that there is, it's possible to know what God intended, so I, the reader, am the source of authority for how to understand the text. Now, in a world like that, it's impossible to have doctrine, because doctrine is commonly understood teaching of Scripture. But because everybody is different, therefore everybody has a different reading of Scripture. Therefore, doctrine and the 28 fundamentals do, can no longer philosophically exist in the postmodern world. This is where our young people are today. If you're older, you're from the modernist worldview where you say you can have a common under understanding of the scripture known as doctrine, but our kids are at the place where they say, well, Dad, that's how you read the Bible, but that's not how I read the Bible. 
Okay? So because we're in a postmodern worldview now and we have postmodern hermeneutics. Now, in deconstructionism, look where this goes for transgenderism. In literary deconstructionism, language is an arbitrary social construct that is often used as a tool of oppression. And it is. There is some truth to that. If I see somebody and I refer to them using a racial slur, I'm dehumanizing them. In World War II, we called the Japanese the Japs. It's easier to kill the Japs than a Japanese man. We call the Germans the Krauts, because they eat sauerkraut. It's easier to kill the Krauts than it is to kill the German. In Vietnam War, we called, we called him Chale, or Gooks. The Vietnamese, why? It's easier to kill a gook than a human being. We dehumanize each other with racial slurs. There is some truth to what the deconstructionists have argued. But they take it a step further, and they say that language is a tool of oppression, and whoever controls language has a dominant position in society, which is why language is changing around us. It's being driven by critical theory, which we'll cover this afternoon. Please come back. But whoever controls language controls the discussion in society. And parallel to critical theory, which you just mentioned, the concept of the oppressors and the oppressed, deconstructionists argue that the path to personal liberation is to eliminate the constraints of language, particularly relating to sexuality and gender, which is categories such as male and female are the social impositions from the Judeo-Christian heritage that uh, deconstructionists say have no intrinsic meaning. You can put whatever meaning you want into those words. So by deconstructing language and eliminating intrinsic meaning to language, transgender activists marginalize those who insist that language has intrinsic meaning and that there is a gender binary of male and female. The logical result of this is that those who insist that language has intrinsic meaning are now guilty of oppression. So if you believe that a man is a biological male, you are now guilty of oppression. Because why can't this microphone be a man? Who's to say that a man is a biological male? So you take meaning out of the word, you strip the meaning out, because if I say this is what man means, the word man, it's a noun, and you say any, any dictionary says the definition of man, okay, or car, or cup, whatever it may be, but the deconstructionists say, no, 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 every word is filled with meaning by the person who uses it. And if you say to me, or society says to me, that this word has a certain meaning, that means you're oppressing me because you're denying my ability to find a different meaning for that word. You following me on this? It's kind of a complex argument, but this is where, where how deconstructionism works. Now, imagine if you had a conversation using deconstructionist principles. Honey? please can you get some Ruibosch at the store today? And she comes back with Graham's crackers. Well, I said Ruibosch. Well, I know you said Ruibosch. Well, this is Ruibosch, but this is Ruibosch to me. <laughs> well, we may laugh, but this is being used to affect your children, to destroy their lives with this deconstructionist approach. They saying, this is a man. Well, who says that's a man? Now, anything could be a man. If I think I'm a man and I'm a biological female, who are you to say I'm not a man? You are oppressing me because you are defining what is a man in a way that does not um, cohere with my lived experience. And my subjective lived experience is the ultimate arbiter of truth. So the sexual revolution thus rejects biblical morality because biblical morality insists that words has meaning as being inherently oppressive and repressive and as a false morality that impedes human freedom. So if you talk about marriage between a biological male and a biological female, you are now impeding the freedom of two individuals to marry regardless of what they believe their gender identities are. So society has to basically, all distinctions have to be eliminated and society is like a gen, just a soup. And everybody's kind of floating around in that soup. Are you following the logic on this? Now I'm not making this stuff up. I read about this stuff all the time and I've read a lot of stuff and you know, it, it kind of filters through your brain and some kind of works out the other end of you. But um, it's, this, is, this is what's being taught in colleges across the West. It's what's being promoted in TikTok and Snapchat and Facebook. It's what your teenage girls are seeing day after day, sitting on their beds in their bedrooms, flipping back and forth, watching the YouTube influencers. So let's go back a bit more history. Do you like the history? The history is important. 
Because it's important to know where the history is, because when you know where you've come from, you understand where this is going. You understand the trajectory that this is moving on. So in 1792, a woman called Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a book called Vindication of the Rights of Women. This is the history of feminism. Feminism kind of plays into this. And she argued that the natural rights of men should apply to women. Most of us would have no uh, disagreement with her. She argued that natural rights, such as the rights to marry, the right to own property, the right to raise children, do not belong to men or women exclusively, but everybody has those rights. About a century later, a man called John Stuart Mill wrote a book on the subjugation of women, and he criticized the way that women were taught to accept a subordinate status in society, which was very much true in 1700s and 1800s, early 1800s. As a result of that, there was a convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. This is when feminism officially began. Um, the feminists who met, the women who met, were very outspoken ladies, and they wanted the basic control of their own lives. They wanted, they were abolitionists, through the, wanted to abolish slavery. They wanted women, when they got married, to the legal right to own their own property, because in America and in Britain, if you got married, everything you owned became your husband's. They wanted the right to vote in the future. They were suffragettes, and we would say, we'd agree with pretty much all of that there. But they also had very close links with spiritualism. And the Fox sisters, you know, with the wrappings? They were literally a few miles away, and they were instrumental in guiding the outcomes of this conference through their connections with spirits, which is why Sister White says have nothing to do with that early wave of feminism, because it was intimately linked with spiritualism. Um, they, they, they argued for full legal equality and citizenship for women in Western societies, where women lost their legal identity once they were married. Now, parallel to this, there was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And they focused on biblical rather than social justice, and they wanted to uphold the dignity of men and women, and they did an awful lot. The Women's Christian Temperance Union mobilized men and women across uh, particularly the states, and they, for instance, they, they lobbied for female-only prisons, for female police officers to interview women who'd been, who were accused someone of sexual assault. Uh, they, uh, they were prohibitionists. They tried to get men off alcohol addiction. They tried to reform men from battering their wives. They lobbied Congress for changes in marital rape laws. And uh, many, many of our pioneers were very favorably disclosed towards the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And if you go to Congress today, Congress has a statutory hall. There are two people from each of the 50 states. And in one of them, um, the state of Illinois, there's a woman there. There are about 13 women in that hall. One of them, um, I think her name is uh, uh, Frances Willard or Claire Booth Luce, one of the two of them. She's in that um, hall, in that statutory hall, because Congress recognizes the profoundly positive impact of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in the 1800s. But things didn't change much, and so you come to the 1960s, and you've got a bunch of well-off white middle-class women in Brooklyn and New York who are unhappy with their status. And after World War II, women lived in a gilded cage in America. They, they had everything they needed materially, but they didn't have any career opportunities. They were expected to stay at home, when the husband came home for work, they were to be dressed in their Sabbath vests and have a Sabbath meal ready for him. And they didn't like this. And so second wave feminists um, said that women were internalizing their own subjugation and uh, they were actually avowedly atheist, secular, and anti-Christian in nature. Uh, classic examples today are Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of Congress. They are second wave feminists. And second wave feminists, what did they argue for? They wanted the right to use birth control. They were opposed to sex discrimination laws. They wanted female actualization. They believed only possible free from the realities of childbirth. We'll mention that, come back to that in a minute. Abortion on demand, that was Roe versus Wade in, I think, 73. The lesbian lifestyle and the elimination of the nuclear family. Now, this here is really important for transgenderism. We've already looked at the deconstructionist philosophy in, in read response criticism in the 60s. And we've seen what the psychologists were saying about gender above the belt and sex below the belt. This here was really critical. Because the argument goes like this. A man and a woman leave college. They both go to law school, hypothetically. It's a random example. And they both join a law firm. And at the age of 25, she gets married and starts having kids. And the man continues to progress in his career. After 10 years, she re-enters the workplace. And she, she, can, she doesn't re-enter where he is, but she enters where she was. And she continues through her career, and he becomes a Supreme Court Justice in, let's say, the state of New York, and she maybe becomes a partner in the law firm, but she never achieves what he does, 
because he has those extra 10 years in his life, his working life, because he's not looking after the kids at home. So this gap, this gap infuriated the feminists, and they said, um, a woman can only achieve her full potential if she is equal to the man in her career. That fulfillment occurs by having equality and career opportunity between men and women. And female self-actualization and fulfillment is only possible when men and women are equal in the workplace. So that means that how can a woman compete with men in the workplace and she has to deny the reality of biology, the reality of bearing children. So that's why the pill and then abortion on demand enables women to keep up with men. You find yourself pregnant, get a quick abortion, and you can keep up with the men in the workplace, you see. And so the idea took off in the 1960s that for a woman to achieve her full potential, she had to deny her biological reality. Or put another way, that the actualized you is different to the biological you. Are you following this? Which means that feminism, which is advanced, exists for the advancement of women socially and legally in society, starts to break down the distinction between biological sex and gender. That the real you is separate to the biological you. And that idea floats through society for the next 50 years. And it comes into our colleges. Simon de Beauvoir, a very famous writer, wrote a book called The Second Sex, say that one is not born, but rather you become a woman. In other words, society and culture teach girls to think of themselves as the second sex or, their sub or as the subordinate sex. Betty Friedan extended these ideas in a book called The Feminine Mystique. Some called it The Feminine Mistake, but um, she wrote there that America produces, quote, millions of young mothers who stop their growth and education short of identity because they're having children. And the feminine mystique of having children has succeeded in burying millions of American women alive. It's kind of hyperbolic language, um, but that's what she wrote. So at the heart of second wave feminism is the notion that the female body, and in particular woman's ability to bear children, is at odds with the, your opportunity to grow and your freedom. So now having children is, is like a temporary inconvenience. It's not a source of joy in your life. Well, I can tell you that I've never met anybody on their deathbed saying, ah, if only I'd spent five more years in the office. Nobody's ever said that. If only I'd balanced one more chart of accounts, I could die happy. If only I'd written one more proposal, built one more bridge, taught one more class, my life would be fulfilled. Nobody ever says that. Pretty much everybody on their deathbed says, I want to be right with my children, and I want to be right with God. They're worried about their human relationships. That's what they talk about. And people's last words are not things like, um, um, oh, I don't know, I agree with the Hegelian dialectical process. They don't say things like that. They say to their son, be faithful to Jesus comes. That's what they say, or please forgive me. Will you forgive me? Because what's most important in life is not your job, it's the relationships you have in life, and in particular, your family of choice. Not your family of origin, but your family of choice. So according to second wave feminism, a woman's body opposes her existence and actualization as a person. She must therefore resist her own body. And so feminism within popular culture starts us towards the idea of accepting what Hirschfeld and some of the other psychiatrists are arguing about gender and sex being separate things. So abortion, that is the, the control of your own body, abortion on demand, becomes the article of faith for second wave feminists. And abortion, this is why in America abortion is such a big, dish, big issue. Because it's the, it's the primary issue around which second wave feminists can, can, can gather and say this is how we achieve equality with men, the ability to kill babies on demand. So the second wave fem feminism in the 60s, 70s, and 80s parallels the, the transgender movement, which is from Dr. Hirschfeld through to the 70s in psychiatry and psychology, with the false concept that the real person is the mind, the will, the subjective sense of self and your self, and your self actualization, which must transcend and liberate itself from your body and the language used by society to describe yourself. Shulamith Firestone took these feminist ideas to the logical conclusion in her book, The Dialectic of Sex. She was a Marxist ideologue uh, using critical theory, which we'll discuss this afternoon. She called for sexual revolution with the sexual uh, underclass, that is women, uh, leading the forefront of eliminating all distinctions between the sexes and women must seize the control of the reproductive process. 
The reproduction of the species by one sex for the benefit of both will be replaced by, replaced by at least the option of artificial reproduction. The tyranny of the biological family will be broken. I'm not sure many people would agree with replacing natural birth with artificial insemination, uh, that those ideas never took off in society. Um, the family must be abolished. Great statement from a very famous second wave feminist. What do they believe? Men and women are intrinsically identical. We're not complementary, we're identical. Wiping out all differences between men and women is a moral imperative. All gender differences in any society are social constructs and are therefore intrinsically unjust. They must be deconstructed so we can make, by force if necessary, a brand new society, a utopia. Now, third wave feminists in the 90s argued about, that was mostly black feminists saying that feminist writings is by white middle class women, what about women of color? So they had some contributions in the 90s. They also argued about whether it was empowering for a woman to dance on a pole before drunk men or not, or whether it was empowering for a woman to perform in a porn movie or not. I have a daughter and the word empowering does not come to my mind when I think about my daughter involved in those activities, but that's what they argued about. So we come to modern feminists. What do they argue for? Uh, they, they want to abolish the gender wage gap. I put the word alleged in here because what they're actually talking about there is lifetime earnings, not what you're paid by the hour. Like a man and a woman can earn the same rate by the hour, but the man in his lifetime will earn more because he's not taking 10 years out to raise children. So the wage gap is really your lifetime's earnings gap. It's not, you can be paid exactly the same, the man will still earn more if he's the one who's not looking after the kids. The right to kill your own unborn children, that's abortion on demand, anti-sex discrimination, white patriarchy, the emasculation of men. We're seeing that these days with more beta men appearing than alpha men. Abortion on demand and gender fluidity. They have an anti-Christian ideology. Why? Because the Bible teaches that God created them male and female. And those, meanings, those words have meaning and definition, and definition by definition is oppressive. We need to strip those words of all their meaning. They're courageously silent on the oppression of women in Islam. They embrace the full LGBTQI agenda, etc., etc. They fully support Planned Parenthood, the major abortion provider. And I, ironically, women are forced into an ideological mold that if you're not with us, that you're a traitor to the women. You're a traitor to the female sex. And so women in the West are told that you must have a career and you must progress and be the same as men and you need to wear suit pants to go to work and that you can't possibly want to raise a family because that means you're a traitor to the female sex. And the result of this is that we have increasingly a problem with marriage across Western society. And why do we have a problem? Because men, when they get married, don't really care how wealthy you are or what background you come from. Men are pretty simple creatures. We have little simple synapse up here. Is she pretty, yes or no? Men are very simple creatures. We have little synapse up here that detects incoming blows and say, I find her attractive, yay or nay. Women, on the other hand, are much more discriminating when it comes to marriage. Why? Because when a woman is looking at a potential husband, she's thinking about her vulnerable years of being pregnant and raising a small family and who's going to look after her. Can she rely on this guy? So a man, if he's here in the social, this high class, low class, and a man is here, let's say he's middle class, he doesn't care what class you come from as long as he thinks you're attractive, he'll marry you. Women will generally not marry down. Women will marry across or up because they've got to worry about being vulnerable in parenthood. Now, as a society, when, say, in America, 60% of college students are female, what does that mean? It means that when they graduate, they're going to look for a mate who is roughly the same education level and or higher, and who's going to compete with, have the same income level as them, but those men don't exist in large numbers. So you have unmarried females who are highly qualified, cannot find a suitable life mate. This happens in many societies. In Britain, it happens in the Jamaican immigrant community where the men are either dead from gang violence or in prison from drug crime, there's no, no man for the Jamaican women to marry their doctors, their nurses, their lawyers, their accountants, their engineers. There's no one suitable for them to marry. And there's a massive problem of unmarried women in the church with not enough men for them to marry because the men have dropped out, drug violence, gang violence, prison, they've blown their minds on drugs, whatever the case may be. And so we have this problem in society. We have these, there are unintended consequences of these ideologies. 
We have nowadays the concept of the TERF, the trans-exclusionary radical feminists. You know, these days, um, with social justice warriors, we'll talk about them this afternoon. If you want to close the discussion, I just heard the term of abuse at you. So in America, if I don't like what you're saying, I'm saying you're a racist. And that one expression, you're a racist, will just close the conversation. I'm not gonna discuss it anymore. You must be right, because you said I'm a racist. And so these terms of abuse are not used because they're helpful to a conversation. They're used to drive a new form of ideology across the West, which is cultural Marxism. We'll discuss that this afternoon in more detail. And so if they don't like what you're saying, you're homophobic, you're transphobic, you're xenophobic, you're claustrophobic, you're a transphobe, etc., etc. And claustrophobic is a joke, obviously, but turf. <laughs> whenever my mother-in-law comes within a thousand miles of me, I start to feel you know, pressured. So. The turf. You've, have you heard the term turf? So turfs are trans-exclusionary radical feminists. This is a new term of abuse for biological women who believe that a biological woman is a biological woman. So look at the community LGBTQI, etc., etc. Two S, the two spirit, and it goes on and on and on. L's and G's and B's deal with sexual orientation. Your sexual orientation, according to psychologists, is your exclusive preference for a certain thing sexually. So I'm a biological male, I'm only attracted to biological females. By definition, I'm heterosexual. If I'm a biological male and I have an exclusive attraction to biological males, therefore I am homosexual or gay, the Gs and the LGB. If I'm a biological female and I have an exclusive attraction to biological females, that means I'm a L, lesbian. That much we all understand, yes? But T is not a sexual orientation, it's a gender identity. This is like saying, this is the car, truck, and plane community. I mean, these, these are like apples and oranges, these are completely different things. T is a gender identity, it's not a sexual orientation, and the T's are insisting that the L's and the G's and the B's must shift their worldview to accommodate the T's. Well, how does this work in practice? Boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, girl declares herself a boy. Is the boy heterosexual or homosexual? She's a biological female. That would imply she's he's a heterosexual. But if she insists on transgender ideology, if, if she is now a trans boy, that means his sexual orientation must shift to keep up with her gender identity, so now he must say he's a homosexual because he's now sleeping with a, a trans boy who's actually a biological female. And the question is, whose rights trump the other one's rights? Do the L's and the G's and the B's trump the T's, or do the T's trump the L's, the B's and the G's? The T, L's, G's and B's. <laughs> and um, if you go to a pride parade, you'll see the women protesting, the lesbians, are protesting what they call the erasure of womanhood because feminism has erased any definition of what it means to be a woman. Thank you to feminism. And the lesbians are insisting that a lesbian is a biological woman who only wants to sleep with a biological woman. And the transgenders are saying, but this man thinks he's a woman, and if you're not willing to sleep with this biological male who thinks he's a woman, therefore you're in a lesbian relationship, you are transphobic and you are bigoted and full of hate. So the lesbians are at war with the transgenders, and the gays are at war with the transgenders. It is not an LGBT community that's at peace with itself. They are, philosophically, they hate each other. So TERF, the trans community, says, well, you're a TERF. That means you're a transphobic, hate-filled, lesbian bigot because you refuse to sleep with men who identify themselves as women. And so TERF is the new term, like you're a racist or you're a TERF. And you see this, you know um, J.K. Rowling is the author of the Harry Potter series. She's a classic second wave feminist. She believes that a biological male is a woman, sorry, a biological female is a woman, and that a biological female who wants to sleep with biological females is by definition a lesbian, and she refuses to accept trans ideology. She says, no, a man cannot identify as a woman and have access to everything that a woman has exclusive access to in society. And I would agree with her. I agree with the lesbians, the gays, and the bisexuals in, in, the, in the, the, the understanding of what it means to be a man and a woman, and because she believes in that, she's been canceled by popular culture. They're destroying her. 
the author of the J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter series, she's being destroyed as transphobic and, and a turf and reactionary and all the rest of it. And so books, bookstores will no longer sell her books. Amazon is thinking about taking her books off the Amazon stores. You know, if it's going on this way, somebody a few months ago made an appeal to Amazon to take the Bible off Amazon because it contains trans-rejecting re trans language. So uh, this is what is happening. So transgender ideology, which considers gender to be fluid and a, socially, a social construct, undermines feminism, which advocates for the advancement of women as a real and essential gender category. The left, that is the radical left, can you could have transgenderism or feminism, but you can't have both. Either men cannot be women, or there is not such a thing as a woman. Either men and women are distinct categories, or to quote Planned Parenthood, an abortion provider, some men have a uterus. If some men have a uterus, that is, if some men are women, then what exactly is a woman? If there is no categorical distinction between a man and a woman, that is, if there is no real difference between the sexes, then what precisely is the purpose of feminism? So feminism has jumped on the trans bandwagon, and it's reached the point where feminism has to eliminate the distinct definition of what it means to be a woman in order to support trans ideology. You can't have both. At its heart, the sexual revolution, including the LGBTQ movement and modern day feminism, has nothing to do with medicine or psychology because you can self-identify. It's actually a revolution against a society anywhere in the West founded on Judeo-Christian foundations with distinct differentiation as an intrinsic part of creation and the subsequent biblical sexual morality. Our world is possible because the story of creation is the story of differentiation. God created night from day, earth from sea, water above from water below, male and female. And if you erase those distinctions, life becomes impossible. So if the sea were to cover the land, life would be impossible. If there would be only land and no water, life would be impossible. If you only had night or you only had day, life would become pretty much impossible. And when God gave us the flood, he erased the distinctions between land and sea, water above and water below, and life pretty much came to a halt. Now, we can't erase those distinctions in the universe or in the planet Earth. What we can do is erase the distinction between male and female. That's what we're trying to do now. So that will lead inevitably to social collapse, which is what we're starting to see across the West. So with social collapse comes the pain. And when you speak with a child who went through the trans process and realizes they look at themselves in the mirror at the age of 24, and their friends are now raising families, and they're happy in their relationships, they look at themselves in the mirror at the age of 24, and they look at their mutilated body, and then they wonder, did I do the right thing here? Why did my psychiatrist encourage me, my doctor encourage me, my um, gender affirming therapist affirm me, why did my school affirm me, why did the government affirm me, why did government uh, media affirm me, why did my school friends say I was a hero, but here I am on my own at the age of 24, 25 with a mutilated body. I'm desperate to go back to what I was, but I can't, and nobody's gonna help me on that route. Like, it's impossible to go back. You might say that this ideology is scientifically fraudulent, philosophically incoherent and morally bankrupt and only advances with massive legal compulsion and social pressure. Why? Because the T is near the bottom of the system of, of oppression and therefore social justice warriors, they want to fight for the lower down you are in the pyramid of oppression, uh, the more we want to fight for you. That's uh, an ideological concept. We'll be talking about that this afternoon. Marilyn Monroe was the most glamorous symbol of the sexual revolution, yet she suffered incredibly multiple levels of profound personal brokenness. She had 12 abortions, dozens of sexual assaults, and abusive relationships, and eventually she committed suicide, and she's the glamour symbol for the sexual revolution. So biblically speaking, the Bible teaches us the good news of the gospel is that there are two sexes with corresponding genders. There's, according to the word of God, there are two sexes, male and female, and a boy is a biological juvenile male, and a man is a biological um, adult male, and a girl is a biological juvenile female, and a woman is a biological adult female. That's what we find in scripture. There's no chaos, there's no, there's no uh, spectrum there. Um, you are either male, female, man, woman, or boy and girl. And so there are, the sexes have corresponding genders. The genders are tied to the sex, whereas the, in transgenderism, the sex has no relationship to your gender identity. This is what we teach as Adventists. 
Therefore, we are created. This is from our fundamental belief, not on marriage, but on the nature of man, the, um, anthropology, biblical anthropology. We are created in the image of God. This is one of our fundamental beliefs. With individuality, the power and freedom to think and do. Though created free beings, each is, and the key word is here, indivisible. We're an indivisible unity of body, mind, and spirit. Depend upon God for life and breath and all else. When our first parents sinned, the image of God in them was marred and they became subject to death. And we, their descendants, we share in this fallen nature and its consequences. We are born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. We all manifest the brokenness of sin, but God in Christ restores the penitent, in penitent mortals the image of their maker. This truly is good news. It cuts through the chaos of today. And as Christians, as Adventists, this is what we believe from Scripture. This is the teaching of Scripture. And it recognizes that there are many people out there who are caught up in these other lifestyles who are not intrinsically evil, but this is just a manifestation of the brokenness of sin. And I stand before you as a broken human being as well. I'm not better. I'm not worse. I'm just as broken in need of a Savior. But that brokenness manifests itself in different ways in all of us. And so there is no place for looking down on or demeaning those who are caught up in these other ideologies and philosophies. Um, many of them experience profound internal pain. The suicidal ideation is profound. The suicide attempt rates are off the chart. There's profound pain within this community. And very few of us have any idea of the internal pain that some members of the transgender community go through. But it's our privilege as Christians to point people back to the truth about our essential human condition, which is we are male or female, man or woman, boy or girl, but we are broken sinners and there is a savior who can make all things new again. And in Jesus, we can become a new creation, which is why if you do have somebody in your church who struggles with you know, same-sex attraction or any of these other issues, um, don't lock them away in a corner, but affirm them and encourage them to live a life of holiness. You know, Jesus did not come to make us all straight. In Leviticus 18, 19, 20, 21, uh, Moses charts all, all the sexual deviations, and repeatedly it says that be ye therefore holy, because God is holy. So we're not all called to be straight. We all manifest the brokenness of sin in different ways, but we are called to be holy. And holiness has a, a hold on me just as much as it has on you. Holiness for the unmarried boy means avoiding pornography. Holiness for the married male means avoiding adultery. For the unmarried boy or girl, it means avoiding fornication. It involves avoiding sinful and playing with sexual thoughts in your minds, for instance. And so holiness, the call to holiness, is not just a call for the homosexual community or the LGBT community to do something that the rest of us are doing naturally. No, we are all called to be holy. We all have a responsibility to use our bodies in a way that brings honor and glory to God and does not destroy other people. I was reading my devotion the other day and came upon this passage. I've read it many times and just kind of skimmed over it. And um, if I can even find it now. I, I shared it with Pastor Lowe the other day and I thought, you know, I just read this. Well, it's not there. Cause it's just come back a few pages here. Finally, brothers and sisters, 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each one of you knows how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion, like the Gentiles who do not know God. And then he says this, that no one should wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, that is, no sexual abuse, because the Lord is an avenger of all things. God is concerned with how we use our bodies. And it's easy for us in the heterosexual community to point a finger at the LGBTQ community when failing to recognize that the overwhelming majority of fornication and porn use is by heterosexuals and heterosexual Christians. So we can't be pointing fingers because we are just as guilty. And that passage here in 1 Thessalonians 4 says, if you wrong a brother or a sister in sexual terms, God is an avenger. He will hold you to account. God sees these things and he sees the pain that comes from these things, but we're kind of getting off the, broken, off the straight and narrow here. So what he's saying in conclusion, I'm not sure how many slides we've got left. What's the time, by the way? Oh, I need to finish, don't I? All right. 
So, civil law, biblical worldview, and sexual revolution. I cover this on Friday, but civil, st civil statutes and the biblical worldview define crime and deal with crime, never with sin and morality. To break civil laws is an incivility. That means it's not going to break, it's not immoral to break the speed limit going home. The sexual revolution believes the same. When it comes to divine law, the biblical worldview holds that divine law, statutes, the Ten Commandments, define sin, and to break the moral rules is immoral. So it, you can go at 150 miles an hour home, it's uh, incivility, but it's not an immorality, despite what your wife may say to you in the car. When it comes to the sexual revolution, they reject the concept of God. It's an atheist movement. They reject any concept of revealed morality. They reject divine law, and there is certainly no final judgment. So there's a difference here in the worldview. When it comes to the separation of church and state, we assume as Christians, based on Jesus and Mark 12, or enter under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, that there is a separation between church and state. But in the sexual revolution, there is no place for the church. There is only the state. And as Christians, we believe that every man, woman, boy or girl in this world is born with certain inalienable rights by virtue of being created in the image of God. In the sexual revolution, you have rights as the state decides to give them to you. And what the state takes or gives, the state can take away. The role of the church in the biblical worldview is that we're entrusted by God with the gospel and with, with the Holy Spirit. Why? To promote the obedience of faith, Romans 1 and 15, to guide individuals into morality and into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. In the sexual revolution, the preachers who march with the pride parades are merely social actors of convenience who promote the, the gay rights movement, but the sexual revolution rejects any concept of biblical morality. So within a biblical worldview, we live within and we're accountable to a revealed moral framework from God. If we both live on a desert island and there's nobody around, I'm not to kill you because I'm still accountable to God for it, even if nobody knows. If I feed your body to the sharks, um, I'm still accountable to God for that. And there's a revealed external moral framework that's absolute. It's not situational. In the sexual revolution, there is no revealed moral framework and there's no accountability before God. What you have to be do is true to yourself. Do as you wish, do as, thou, do as thou wilt, which is a very famous Satanist expression from Alistair Crowley in the 1930s. Do as thou wilt, and you are your own God, and nobody should place any limits on the seeking of your own happiness. And anybody who tries to limit your own happiness by saying that some things are moral or immoral is an oppressor, and they need to be eliminated from society, which is why the church and Christians are now the object of attack by the sexual revolution. Civil authorities and morality. Civil authorities should not legislate for morality. We believe that. The, the Inquisition in Catholicism or Sharia law in Islam is a logical conclusion of imposing morality. We disagree with that. The sexual revolution also believes that civil authorities should not legislate for morality, but it is happening by a cancel culture. So I spoke on a related topic on Friday. We put it up on YouTube and they banned it. So cancel culture does exist. Meaning and purpose. We believe as Christians that there is an, an intelligent God who created an objectively real universe that can be known, understood, and described. The sexual revolution means that meaning and purpose believes that meaning and purpose are meaningless concepts per se because the universe has no meaning or purpose. It's a random explosion. Meaning, if it is to exist, is relative, subjected, and generated by the individual as he or she wishes. Do you have in South Africa things like the 100 best rugby players of all time, the top 100 movies, the top 100 artists? Why do we do that? Because philosophically, we live in a universe that has no meaning, but we're searching for meaning. So we create an artificial meaning by saying these are the top 100 rugby players of all time. This is a search for meaning in a society that denies the possibility of meaning. Gender, in the biblical worldview, is an actual reality that can be described and embraced along with the correct modes of gender expression that correspond to your biological sex. According to the sexual revolution, gender is your personal subjective understanding of who you are, and we actually evolved via random mutations in an intrinsically meaningless process where nobody knows what is right or wrong, nobody knows what is up or down, nobody knows whether two is worth more than one or anything, because everything is, is true in the eyes of the beholder. So in conclusion, for those people who are experiencing the brokenness of sin as an involuntary gender dysphoria, dys, uh, dysphoria, I want to affirm again that Jesus died for you on Calvary. 
And if you were the only person who lived on planet Earth and you had gender dysphoria, Jesus Christ would still have died for you. And his forgiveness and his grace and his healing are sufficient for all who turn to him in repentance and faith. Jesus commanded that we love one another, not as the world loves, but as he first loved us. And this genuine love for our neighbor cannot be separated from our love of truth and how God's truth relates to our neighbor. Therefore, we are called to testify lovingly and truthfully to the truth about gender dysphoria and to prayerfully encourage and steadfastly stand by those who are affected as they seek to overcome their intense personal discomfort through counseling and psychological care so that one day, as in the overwhelming majority of cases, they can have an alignment between mind and body. My prayer is that each of us, by God's grace, will use the freedoms we enjoy here in South Africa, freedoms of speech, freedoms of association, freedoms of conscience, freedoms of worship, to live lives full of both grace and truth, that we may all find and follow the Good Shepherd to our eternal life, regardless of how the brokenness of sin is manifest in each of our lives today. May God bless us as we live for Jesus in the midst of an increasingly broken society. Love your neighbor as yourself and lead them to Jesus Christ. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we see that our world is ascending into confusion, that as our world turns its back on you, we start worshiping the creature rather than the creator. And in so doing, we become futile in our thinking. And Father, these are not just ideological discussions. There are real boys and girls whose lives are being destroyed by the transitioning process. Encouraged by a society that thinks this is the coolest thing to do. And by a society that will ignore that person who wants to commit suicide in their 20s or 30s. Because the transitioning process just brought greater despair. Father, may our churches, may our homes, may our hearts, may our hearts be harbors of hope for people who are struggling with gender dysphoria. Father, whether it's our children, our grandchildren, our nephews, our nieces, members of our church, may people see in us that it is possible to become a new creation in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for hearing and for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.